Greetings, humanoids. It's Akbar and Adam coming at you, episode 16 in our course on the philosophy of climate change, a course that aspires to take an interdisciplinary and problem-oriented approach to understanding climate change. We are in our module on theories of climate politics or climate science and context. We've developed three theories of climate politics. And here I want to look uh, specifically at the media. As you know, I think media is so important with climate politics and understanding. And so we talk about it quite a bit, and this is just one lecture explicitly to focus on it. Um, before we jump into the outline, keep in mind this quote, Akbar's quote of the day, I disapprove of what you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. Uh, Evelyn Beatrice Hall, summarizing the views of Voltaire. This is what we're gonna call the classically liberal rights defending view of speech a position that we will both defend and critique in what follows. So keep that in mind. I want to, what do I want to do today? Well, in general, get us thinking about how media shapes climate politics, how all of our understandings about climate are mediated in different ways. But that is a huge thing. So I want to really focus on this balancing act, I call it, between the rights to free speech on one hand and the responsibilities to speak truth on the other. And I want to focus on this because it has so much to do with the way climate change is represented in the media and all of the choices people have to make within the media landscape, which then influence what people believe and the decisions that get made. So a little bit on media theory and our media landscape, and then really focusing on uh, individuals and platforms with this question of the balancing act. So I'll use these two stories to illustrate it and then we'll spend most of our time talking about this balancing act in hopes that this is a useful oh, metaphor or framework or tool for you to, to think through climate politics. So um, Marshall McLuhan famously said the medium is the message. In other words, the, co the content or information delivered by a medium is shaped by that medium, it's not neutral. A good book that takes McLuhan uh, and develops it further is Neil Postman's Amusing Ourselves to Death. And he argues that the age of television, this is a book written in the 1980s, television turns politics into entertainment and amusement. It does that to everything. And it's not about the particular news program or the way it's produced. It's the medium itself that does that. So now think about if, if this thesis is true, think about our media landscape. Um, we have, we're not in an oral culture, we're a literate culture in some sense, but it's one that's beyond even just electronic like television, now it's a digital internet-based media culture that, that we live in. Um, and McLuhan's point is that each medium supports certain kinds of ideas and even mindsets. Neil Postman, talks about the Lincoln-Douglas debates, which would go on for hours and hours. I mean, imagine that just wouldn't happen within our mediated landscape now with the kind of mindsets that we have now. The attention span simply is not there. The bandwidth is not there. Or think about Civil War soldiers and the letters they wrote, wrote home, just the medium of pen and paper and how that differs with, let's for example, email, right? Now you look at our media landscape, hyper fast, super big, very diverse, distracting, episodic. Think about those TikTok videos that go from one video to the next. There's no connection between the two. They're fractured, right? So everything is like, now this, now that, now for something completely different, right? All media is manipulative and it has that potential at least. And what really worries me and a lot of people is this filter bubble or this fracturing impact of our media where everybody can tailor their own news feed and we might then inhabit incommensurable realities. So on the top here, you have a, what happens in one minute on the internet? Well, 278,000 tweets, 72 hours of YouTube videos uploaded, right? So where is the bandwidth to connect all of this, make sense of it, and hold the attention around it? And then you also have just such a diverse media landscape. How can we think about whether it's, which ones are balanced and fair? So that's that bottom graph about media bias. These are all super important things to keep in mind. Because all of this is influencing what you think and what you believe. But that's enough on a, a general level on that. 
I'm talking to individuals as media consumers. We all do that. So we all need to have critical thinking and personal responsibility. We're all producers. I mean, maybe you write articles and, and share your own opinions on social media or other platforms. So you have a responsibility for truth telling and to be attentive to your rhetoric. What truths are you highlighting? How are you telling them, right? But I'm really particularly interested in publishers and platforms. So the people who run uh, journals or shows and also platforms like Twitter and Facebook that have these gatekeeping and fact checking responsibilities. So what do they publish? What do they platform? What do they push? What do they block, right? What do they censor? What do they highlight? This shapes uh, our understanding, right? And then it shapes the way decisions are made and what decisions are made. So two stories, you read these, these are linked in your notes. Samantha Allen tells a story about the ways in which a problematic, he said, she, she said, journalism uh, not only leads to the promulgation of disinformation or misinformation, falsehoods, junk science, but actively harms transgender community, a community that's already marginal and vulnerable. Right? Tells a story in there of one transgender reporter who was fired for what he calls truth telling, something we'll get to in a little bit. On the other hand, you've got the story of Roger Pilkey, my former mentor, one of the most uh, influential climate science policy scholars out there, who talks about being drummed out of certain circles of academia and even major media platforms for no good reason, right? For only because he harbored beliefs and that were unpopular, but actually were very legitimate and grounded even in the IPCC itself, right? So both of these are bad outcomes, I wanna suggest. And they both represent falling off of a balancing act one way in the first case and another way in the other case. So here's our balancing act that I wanna to get to. Um, this is not a binary, right? So it's a spectrum. You got this pole here that you're trying to hold. You can tip too far one way or too far the other way. And I wanna suggest the ends of the spectrum are this truth telling side and this rights defending side. So this is the kind of image I want you to keep in mind as we go through this here. And I'll try to, and you keep those stories in mind too, right? So if you tip too far one way, and this is a Samantha Allen story about transgender um, individuals in the transgender community, but this also applies, I think you'll see obviously to climate change journalism. Tip this th too far this way, you slip into lazy, irresponsible, he said, she said, both sides journalism, where issues are made to seem less settled than they really are, right? Here comes the climate denier, he says, oh, I don't know, you know, maybe climate change isn't really happening, and if they get represented equally with like the IPCC, that's problematic, right? So this artificially keeps controversies open in ways that are contrary to established facts and expert consensus. So what we need are gatekeepers to hold our discourse up to quality standards by being mindful about what they platform and publish and by putting claims that are made into the context of established science, right? So the problem would be not enough quote unquote policing, but really just curation, contextualization of speech. We need to be more attentive to what's getting put out there and to make sure people understand the broader context of it. When something's put out there that represents something that's just factually untrue, you may still want to put it out there to say, this is what these people believe, but you need to also then say, this is untrue, right? So you got to put that context around it. Um, but you tip the other way. Now think of the Roger Pilkey story. You fall into a dangerous, chilling censorship that can silence and stigmatize legitimate but unpopular perspective. That's not healthy for a democracy either, right? So we need gatekeepers that will protect the rights to speech and expression because there are controversies and points of debate that are legitimate. Just because you're skeptical or you're questioning something or you're doubting, it doesn't mean you're a denier or a conspiracy theorist or a crank or a paid stooge, right? Not, you can't cram everybody into these narrow boxes of you've got the right answer or you're obviously uh, wrong, right, and corrupt. Um, so the problem is too much policing of speech, thought policing even, what we call cancel culture nowadays. This link I put in your notes, I won't go ahead and read this whole quote to you, but you, 
You might want to follow this up. I thought this was really beautiful. So this is the defense of that classically liberal position. I will defend to the death your right to say something, even though I disapprove of it, right? Why do we do that? Out of epistemic humility, because yeah, I have my belief, but it may be wrong. <laughs> so I need, I should want to have alternative views published and presented, right? So that we can think together about what is true. So that's that side of the position, right? Now, note here, I want to connect this to our um, theories of climate politics. So those most sensitive to the rights defending side of the poll. So think about Roger Pilkey now, right? I think they're more likely to have a paradox theory of climate politics. Now I put in context a little uh, parentheses, these are the foxes. I won't have time to talk about this, but in your notes is an article by Steve Fuller. And it's, he says to embrace our inner fox. Okay, so you might wanna look at that. That's just kind of a, a bonus feature. So people who are sensitive to this, and again, think of Roger Pilkey, they, they wanna really embrace this rights defending sort of side of the balancing act here. What they're highlighting is the need for epistemic humility. What they're showing us is that look, nature is sufficiently rich that there can be a plurality of legitimate perspectives and we need to hear all of those if we have any chance of achieving wisdom in sound policy making, right? Now, often too, you would have some suspicions of the old guard institutions, the lions in Steve Fuller's phrasing and their claims to neutrality, because maybe, you know what? Maybe those have just become encrusted versions of authority and tradition, right? And we need to question that authority. That's actually being really scientific. We don't wanna mistake tradition for truth. Now the risk here, as we've said before, with the paradox theory is you slip into a false equivalency. So you naively could allow powerful actors, the carbon industrial complex, to use this to their advantage. They could say, look, yeah, all voices should be heard. We have a voice, it's a legitimate perspective, right? And then you start getting the NIPCC, which is a kind of front group for Heartland Institute that wants to get us to doubt the climate consensus. You get them held on the same level as the IPCC. And that's dangerous. So this is the danger coming out of this um, emphasis, right? Plato, by the way, said something like this would be the end of democracy, right? You get this democratization of epistemology. Everybody can, can produce and share their own knowledge claims like we have with our media landscape now. It's gonna lead to chaos. It's gonna lead to civil war. It's gonna lead to a retroactive, re reactionary pullback for people seeking certainty that they can only find in an authoritarian figure, right? And this is the end of democracy. Okay, now, Flip it around, those most sensitive to the truth-telling side of the poll, so think about the Samantha Allen story about transgender reporting, they're more likely to have a propaganda theory, I think, of climate politics, right? So these would be the lions in Steve Fuller's telling. And now here's the, the good thing about it. So think about, about this is the strength of this theory. And I didn't really go through strengths and weaknesses of the propaganda theory last time, but the strength is that you call out BS when you see it, right? You ensure that the real science is de demarcated from the junk science. The truth is demarcated from lies. And you squelch disinformation. You contextualize claims, right? So you're our quality control, right, for our media, which forms our beliefs, which shapes our decisions, right? But the risk here, okay, this is the downside of the propaganda theory, is you create a false binary. So you might develop this Manichaean dualistic, white hat, black hat, good guy, bad guy view, a dogmatic view that leads you to police things and cram them into these ideological boxes of either pure or impure. And then you end up silencing legitimate voices that don't fit into those clean boxes. This is the same link I put earlier. Judith Curry has a similar story to Roger Pilkey, drummed out of academic circles, just for expressing some concern about the level of certainty represented in certain climate models, right? That's the sort of thing, that's the kind of debate we should be airing and defending and not silencing and shutting down because we're worried, oh, it might muddy the waters or this doesn't fit 
the clean messaging we need to have around climate change. Okay, that's that's some of the danger um, from this emphasis. So there's our challenge, right? Finding the balance. I disapprove of what you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. Think about that again. Is that right? Um, I don't know, but look, it's not about picking truth telling, right? So Samantha Allen, look, we have a responsibility to tell the truth, to contextualize our claims, to note when there's a consensus, to note when a controversy has been closed, to note the biases of people who are speaking in this debate. All of that is part of truth telling, right? Okay, we have a responsibility to do that, but we also, I would think, sure as heck want to defend people's rights to speech, right? So they won't slip into some sort of totalitarian tyranny. So how do we balance these? I think that's really the question. Now, I don't know um, if it, no one's disputing the rights defending sentiment. Um, maybe some people are, but I would bet most people are saying, yes, I, I believe you should, you should have the right to your speech, right? You can voice your own opinion. I think that's a widely held, and, and at least insofar as it goes, a healthy democratic principle to embrace. But that doesn't mean that others have to or should provide a platform for you, right, in your opinion. And when your opinion is quoted, it should be contextualized and fact-checked, right? Like one of the, I think it was in Samantha Allen's piece, she said, sunlight is the best disinfected only if you clear away the clouds. In other words, okay, so you want to be this classically liberal position of, of defending everybody's right to say everything. So that's the the sunlight, get it out there, right? Let's share all of our perspectives. That's great. But if it's cloudy, if it's all murky and cloudy in terms of we don't actually know who's saying this and whether it holds up, whether it fits in with what we know about the world, or is this just some crank and paid stooge saying something? We got to clear all those clouds away so that we can see clearly, right? At the end of the day, I don't think there's a rule or a formula or a recipe for this. The balancing act itself as a metaphor or a tool is limited, right? You just need to have context sensitive judgments. In other words, you gotta be a critical thinker about this stuff. Okay, that's uh, enough for me. Akbar and I were talking about all of this and he said, you know, you know that saying, uh, everybody's entitled to their own opinion but not their own facts. I said, yeah, I know that Akbar. He said, well, look, opinion may be an entitlement but judgment is a responsibility. And I like that. That's shades of Hannah Arendt, and you know that I really like her stuff too. So it's a little bit of wisdom there from Akbar. Hopefully this was helpful. And until next time, may the force be with you.